flood this space today as we lift up and honor your name, the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Sing with us, church. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. 
Jesus tells this story in the book of Luke, chapter 15. He's gathered with some people and they're sharing a meal. And some that are very religious, that have been in church, that know the scriptures. And some on the very far end of the other side of that spectrum. And those that would consider themselves religious started to kind of judge Jesus for what he's doing. Saying, why are you hanging out with these sinners? And instead of just correcting him in that moment, instead of saying something directly to them, he tells this story. He talks about this man who made his livelihood from livestock. He had a hundred sheep that he raised, that he cared for as his very own. They're his means of income, but also he had probably raised them from birth, knew them individually. But there was this one, there was this one that wandered off on its own. And rather than just cutting his losses and letting it go and, and keeping the 99 that were present, he chases after this one that had wandered away. And he finds it. And he puts it onto his shoulders and carries it home. You see, the 99 that had stayed, they were good. They knew exactly where they needed to be. They were safe, they were secure. They were in the presence of the good shepherd. But the one that wandered off needed a savior. And that story is the same for us and just as true today. Because there are many of us in here that wander off. And we need someone who is loving, that is kind, that is good to come and find us, to put, him, put us on his shoulders and to take us home. And that's the beauty of, of when we gather together as a church is we get to hear those reminders, whether we might consider ourselves very religious or on the other side of the spectrum, there is a God in heaven who sent his son to die on our behalf so that we could have life and we could have hope and that it would be good. And that's one of the reminders that I need on a probably daily basis. But I always am so excited when we get together just like this, church, and we sing words just like this. I speak to my heart and soul and remind me that though I have wandered off and been lost, there's a good God. Don't pursue us. Let's sing this. Before I spoke a word, you were singing no.
So good to sing that together today. Friends, as our pastor makes his way out today, would you do me a huge favor? Would you go ahead and start off by grabbing a seat? Hello, sir. Welcome. Wow, that's a lot of baggage. Are you checking in all of that baggage with us today? Yeah. You would like it to fly with you to each and every single destination? Yeah, that's uh, bringing it with me. I'm going to need you to weigh all of that baggage on the scale here, please, for us. Uh -huh. There we go. Your baggage is heavy. Oh. Wow, it appears even your baggage has its own baggage. So in our tier system for baggage pricing, yours is marked as excessive, which means that your checked-in baggage comes to a total of $150 in the addition to the $25 travel fee, and the carry-on that you're taking will be an additional $75, not to mention the overages, bringing your grand total to $525.78 with us. How will you be paying? Uh, debit, I guess. Okay. Sure. Is there anything else we can do today to make your experience more accommodating or comfortable for you and or all of your baggage? No, no, uh, no. You just please take my baggage. Good morning, Sandals Church. That is a weak clap, man. Some of you have come to church on the right day. Because we are going to talk about rest, and clearly some of you did not do that last night. You did not rest. Anybody ever uh, flown a red eye? Anybody ever done that? Whose idea was that? I'm pretty sure it was Lucifer himself, right? A red eye. Oh, but I save money and I'll sleep on the plane. Anybody ever try to sleep on a plane? It's terrible. This is literally what I wear when I, or what I, what I take when I, when I fly. My wife laughs. I got my little back pillow because I got a bad back because I'm old. I got my neck pillow because I have the longest neck on earth. I must be half giraffe. And then I have to have clothes inside because you never know if the airline's going to be freezing or roasting. Amen? You don't know. Nobody knows where it is. And so it's impossible to sleep. And so here's the thing that I've discovered. 
I just don't believe that our bodies were designed to fly through multiple time zones, amen? We're just not supposed to do that. Like your body doesn't know where it is. You ever been somewhere and you wake up in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m., like the Lord Jesus himself woke you up? Like I never, I didn't wake up that way this morning. Like it's like, oh, I'm ready to go. Oh, it's 2.30 in the morning. What am I gonna do for the next four hours? And that's just the reality. Look, traveling is brutal. But here's the thing. I believe that we live in a culture right now where we're traveling at a pace that God did not design us to live at. We're going too fast, too far. We're not resting. We're not sleeping. We're all cranky. We're all a mess. We're all disasters. And the baggage we're going to talk about today is the bags under your eyes, right? And some of you saw them. Some of you ladies tried to cover it up, but we see it. We see it, right? We see it. And so oftentimes, other people notice when we need rest before we do. Anybody ever said this? What's wrong? Are you okay? Are you okay? What's wrong? I'm just old. This is the face God gave me. Get off my back, buddy. So let's begin with a word of prayer. And let me just say this. If at the end of the message, you're not ready to repent, you didn't listen. Whether you're a Christian or this is your first time in church, God's calling you to a different life. God's calling you to rest and my prayer is that you would respond today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. God, we're tired, we're broken. Lord, we're, we're going at a pace that we cannot sustain. Lord, whether we're in high school, college, single or married, one kid or a thousand kids, God, we are, we are traveling too fast. And we are jet lagged, God. This society, this culture is wearing us down. Speak to us today, we pray in the name of Jesus, and command us, Lord, to rest. And help us, Lord, by the power of your spirit to be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we're gonna talk today about one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Now if you're new to Christianity, you, you've never heard of this guy, and you've never heard of this story. In the book of 1 Kings, Elijah is the most dominant character. Elijah is the prophet of God who's called to speak to the people of God in the land of God. Now, here's the thing. How many of you have ever met an idiot Christian? Raise your hands. Okay? Okay, that we've always been around. Just because you live in the land of God, just because you claim to be a person of God, does not mean you're a follower of God. And so in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, we're in the land of God with the people of God, and there's a prophet of God named Elijah, and they don't listen to him. No matter what he says... Do you know what his nickname is? Elijah's nickname is Troubler of Israel. That's his nickname. Here comes the Troubler of Israel because he's always saying, you're not following God. And so God gets fed up and maybe we need to listen with the land of Israel and so he stops the rain. Maybe it's not global warming. Maybe it's God cooling. We've cooled off from God so God shut us off. And we need to pay attention. We need to look around. And so the whole land suffers because the people of God are not listening to the prophet of God. And there's no rain. And there's this great famine. And there's this great trouble. And so Ahab sends his soldiers out everywhere. He's one of the mightiest kings. People don't realize this. The Bible says he's one of the worst kings. But militarily, economically, Ahab is one of Israel's greatest kings. So he sends out his soldiers to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, and they are given these orders. You find this prophet because I'm going to bring him to me and I'm going to kill him. And so one day Ahab goes up to one of, or excuse me, Elijah goes up to one of Ahab's generals and he, he says, his name is Obadiah. He says, Obadiah, you tell Ahab we can meet today and you tell him to meet me on Mount Carmel. But you tell him, you bring all the people of Israel and you bring all the prophets of Baal. Now, some of you guys have no idea what Baalism is. You're going to laugh. Baalism is the worship of your sexual desires. Does that sound familiar? The worship of your sexual desires. This is what our culture says. God would never give me desires he didn't call me to act on. The Bible says God has called all of us to turn from our desires and to turn to him. And, and Elijah says this. You bring the prophets of Baal, and we're going to have a showdown between your God and the true God. And so here's Elijah, the only prophet, against 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And here's what Elijah says. Here's the deal. You're going to put an altar, and I'm going to put an altar. And you're going to sacrifice on the altar, and I'm going to sacrifice on the altar. And you're going to call to your God, and I'm going to call to the true God. And whoever the true God is will bring down fire from heaven and roast the sacrifice in front of us. And the prophets of Baal, 
They do their thing. They set up their altar. They slaughter the calf. They put it on there, and they pray, and they scream, and they cry, and they dance, and they do everything. And it's in the middle of the afternoon. They've been crying out all day, literally just crying out to their God, Baal, crying out. And, and, and your English translations don't say it exactly the way it says in Hebrew, but Elijah begins to mock them. Where is your God? Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's hard of hearing. This is actually what it says in the Hebrew. Maybe he's pooping. Where is he? Where is he? And so you know what the prophets of Baal do? Because Baalism is a fertility cult, they cut themselves believing that the blood from their bodies will hit the earth and awaken the spirit. And so they begin to cut themselves and wound themselves and they cry out all day long, but Baal does not respond. Then Elijah calls for the people to reset the 12 stones of the altar of God that's been torn down. They set the stones, they place wood on it. Then they sacrifice the animal. They place the animal on top. Then they dig a trench around it. And, and Elijah says, douse it with water. And so they do. And then he says, douse it again. And so they do. And then he says, douse it again. And so they do. Literally the entire altar is soaked with water and there's a trench around it that is now full of moisture. And Elijah calls out to the one true God and he says, show the people of Israel today who you are. Remember I've told you, you do not need to be afraid of the fire of hell. It is the fire from heaven we should fear. And the fire from heaven comes down, and this is what the Bible says, it burns the meat, it burns the wood, it says it burns the stones, and all of the water, and Elijah says, choose this day whom you will serve, and Israel says, we knew it was God, we knew it was God, we always knew it was God, we knew it was God. And literally, there's a revival that takes place, and so then Elijah turns to the king, and he says, king, listen to me. The, the drought is over. You go back and you better hurry because the rain is coming and your chariot won't make it if the, if the road is turned to mud. So you better get going. And Elijah bows down and he begins to pray to God. Hadn't rained for three and a half years. And Elijah began to pray. God, bring the rain. God, bring the rain. God, bring the rain. Listen to me. For those of you who prayed to God, God didn't answer. Elijah calls upon God seven times. And every time after he prays, he sends his servant. The servant says, no cloud, no cloud, no cloud, no cloud, no cloud. And finally on the seventh time, he says, there's the cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah says, that's it. Let's get out of here. And so then Elijah, it's the Bible says, girds himself up. And he runs from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. He runs. He runs all the way there, all the way to the capital of Israel to declare that a revival has taken place and literally God is taking over. And that's when the story begins. Let's look at our notes. First Kings 19, one through nine. When Ahab got home, that's Jezreel, he told Jezebel, that's his wife, if you ever have a girl, do not name her Jezebel. It's not a good name just because it's in the Bible. Do not name your daughter Jezebel. He told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. Remember, there's a great revival that's taking place. All the prophets of Baal have been slaughtered. God did a mighty deed, including that he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods, she doesn't worship the one true God, may the gods strike me and even kill me by this time tomorrow if I have not killed you just as you've killed them. Underline these words. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. Why? Many of you don't understand what took place in this story. You go, oh my gosh, how on earth can you go from calling fire down from heaven to run from the queen? She's not even the king. She's not in charge of anything. How on earth is it that you slaughter 450 false prophets and then one woman says on Twitter, I'm gonna kill you, and you freak out? You wanna know why? Write this in your notes. He's tired. He's exhausted. He just battled the prophets of Baal all day. Some of you never read it in the notes. Do you know when he prayed? The Bible says he bowed down with his head between his knees as he prayed. You know what that means? He's exhausted. Then he just ran by foot from Mount Carmel to Jezreel. You know how far that is? We don't know exactly what path he took, but it's somewhere between 17 and 30 miles. How many of you will never run between 17 and 30 miles? Raise your hands. He's tired. 
He's wiped out. He's exhausted. Listen to me. It's easy to believe in God when you're rested. I don't even believe in Jesus in the morning until I drink coffee. <laughs> Is there anybody else with me, right? I do not have my quiet time until I've had my coffee time. Right? It's coffee, then Christ. If I get it backwards, I don't read anything. Listen to what he says. She said, you're going to die. Elijah was afraid for his life, so he went to Beersheba, a town of Judah. Underline these words. Then he left his servant there. He's abandoning the ministry. He just went from God's most powerful prophet ever to I'm done. And then he went alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat under a solitary broom tree and prayed that what? He might die. He went from a superhero to suicidal in one day. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who've already died. And then he lay down and he slept under a broom tree. But as he was sleeping, the angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And so he ate and drank, and what? He lay down again. He fell asleep again. Why? He's exhausted. He's wiped out. He's tired. Then the angel of the Lord came up again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, and he ate, and he drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, where? The mountain of God. The mountain of God. Listen to me. Some of you are traveling at a pace in your life, at work, with your kids. Some of you are traveling at a pace where you're going to abandon your faith and give up on God. And listen to me, you don't, you don't need a moment with God. You know what you need? A muffin and a nap. <laughs> That's what you need. You just need to go to sleep and eat. That's all Elijah needed. Elijah's like, I want to die. And God's like, have a muffin. Have a muffin. Take a nap. Right? How many of you guys have ever babysat or been around a two-year-old? Isn't it amazing how sweet and kind and wonderful they are when they've slept? Right? Oh, oh, what can I do? It's so fun. This is so great. You're so cute. You're a little person. This is awesome. And then when they miss their nap, they turn into the devil himself. <laughs> We're the same way. We just hide it better. You're just a two-year-old undercover. That's all you are. And you and I, we need just as much rest. Write this down. My need for rest is real. It's real. Jesus said this. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people. Do you know why God created the Sabbath? Because you need it. You need it and not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is not so much about a religious, religious ritual. It's about your need for rest. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. So here's the problem. For like 2,000 years, Christians have been fighting over what day we rest. Do you know why? We're not resting. We're fighting over when we should take a nap rather than taking a nap. Take a nap. Don't get it twisted. Listen to Jesus. The Sabbath was made for you. You need it. You need a nap, so take it. I did some research this week. This is what medical journals are saying. America and the Western world is chronically underrested. Google this on the way home today. Google this phenomenon. In Japan, it is socially acceptable to sleep in McDonald's. Isn't that bizarre? People go to McDonald's and they just sleep. They pass out. They cannot stay awake. Isn't that crazy? I would never sleep in public. I'm afraid of you guys. I don't know what you're going to do to me. Can you imagine you're in McDonald's? <sighs> out. Out. And what they're saying is we, we are chronically underrested. 
And do you know why your doctor doesn't hold you accountable for sleep? Because they're worse than you are. Any, any medical practitioners out here? Right? Our nurses, our doctors, they work crazy schedules. No wonder they can't hold us accountable. They're bad models. They are. We're chronically under-rested. When I don't get enough rest, write this down, I get sick. There's a great book out there, and you can write it down. It's called The Body Keep Score. Your body's like, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. You're not going to lay down. You're not going to rest. Out! And you're sick. You're sick. A lot of young parents, when their kids are little, they think, oh, I, my kid's constantly getting me sick. Do you know why your kid's constantly getting you sick? Because he or she is constantly keeping you awake. When I don't rest, I get sick. Next, you know what it does? You can't think. How many of you guys have ever said this? You just look at the world and you're like, what are they thinking? Does anybody feel like the world just got stupid? Do you know why it is? It's medically true. We're not sleeping. We get dumb. We can't think. We can't think. We literally cannot think. Sometimes, man, I'm so tired. My wife is talking to me, and I'm like, you know what, babe? What you're saying is super important, and I super love you, I think, right now. But what I need to do is I need to take a nap so I can pay attention to what you're saying. I'm serious. It's not that this is important. It's just that if I don't sleep... I'm gonna say something stupid, and I need all the cells right now in my brain to fully function so I don't tick you off. (laughs) Okay, guys, write this down. When you don't sleep, it lowers your sex drive. You're like, oh, I just got serious. (laughs) Now, some of you young people, you think that'll never happen. You get get to the point in your life where you're like, sex or the pillow, hmm. Yeah, the pillow, right? You're just, you think it'll never happen, but that's how chronically underrested we are. You're just like, oh my gosh, I got to take a nap. Okay? Ladies, pay attention to this one. Okay? The sex one got the guy's attention. Ladies, when you don't sleep, you gain weight. Oh. Oh. It's true. The less we sleep, the more weight we gain. Isn't that crazy? Next, we're accident prone. We went to Israel in one day, in one day. My mom broke her ankle, my aunt twisted hers, and my daughter fell on her face. And I did not respond well to any of their injuries. Literally, my daughter fell as we're going out to lunch, and in front of her whole church, I'm like, what's your problem? And everyone's like, oh, I am, I gotta go to harvest. I can't, oh, Pastor, Pastor Matt is a little out of control. One of our pastor's wives said this, you missed that one, pastor. (laughs) This This is true. When you don't sleep, you look worse. Some of you need to look at your face. You cannot afford. I'm just saying, as your pastor, you cannot afford to miss any beauty sleep. Right? Let's just be honest. Some of our faces can't miss a nap. Right? So singles, some of you, you don't don't need to be on some internet site. You just need to to lay down. Lay down. It will improve your score. I sleep well. I look better. It's true. I've been back from vacation for two weeks. People keep saying, you look so good. You look so good. It's because I rested. I was away from you. (laughs) One guy got it. (laughs) Okay, listen to me. I don't care whether you're a teenager. And by the way, parents, you know, teenagers need more sleep because they're growing. Most of us are just growing this way. They're growing this way. Your body's growing. You need rest. You need rest. My need for rest is real. Next, rest, if you're a Christian, is a command. It's not called the 10 pray about it. We're not the church of the nine commandments you choose. Right? You're like, well, it's not like it's written in stone. Well, (laughs) it was. It was. Rest is a commandment from God. This is what God says. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. I want you to write in the word holy. It means different. That's what the word holy always means. 
We think of it as moral perfection, which occasionally can mean from that, but here's what it means, set apart. So when God says you're holy, do you know what, you, what he's saying? You're supposed to be different. You're supposed to be set apart. You're not supposed to be like all the other idiots on earth. You're unique. So God says the Sabbath day is holy. Keep it holy, observe it. As the Lord your God has, circle this word, commanded you. You have six days each week for ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. It's dedicated to him. On this day, no one in your household may do any work. Wives, this includes your husbands. Guys, this is just between me and you. Married guys, raise your hands. Guys, let's just pretend there's no women in here right now. I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine you tell your wife this. Hey, baby, I'm going out with the guys. We're going to have some fun today. I left you a little list of things that need to get done while I'm gone. How do you think that's going to go? That's what my wife does every time she leaves the house. Hey, I'm going out with the girls. We're going to get our nails done. I left a list of 27 things that you need to do while I'm Sabbathing. <laughs> it says, the Sabbath day of rest is dedicated to the Lord your God. On this day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, frontsiders, your sons and your daughters. Praise God. No chores on the Lord's day. Kids can tell your parents it's a commandment written in stone. <laughs> this includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, which is weird because we live in the Inland Empire, but in Newport Beach, they're like, oh, I'm going to circle that. <laughs> servants get a day off too. <laughs> your oxen and your donkeys. You see, ladies, it does include your husbands. Yes. <laughs> Just circle that. Yep. And your livestock and any foreigners living among you. It's mandatory for all. Literally, when we were in Israel, I was a little frustrated because I said, I don't understand why we can't fly El, A El Air. I said, why can't we fly El Air? And somebody's like, what's El Air? Literally, it translates from Hebrew, God's airline. God's airline. Why can't, why can't we fly God's airline? We're going to God's country. Why can't we fly God's airline? And here's what the tour guide said. He said, the problem is booking with them is they're closed every Friday night from sundown to every Saturday to sundown. The entire airline stops Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown. They rest. Six days they work, one day they're off. And that's really, really hard for us in the West to book flights. Let me just ask you this a question. If you're gonna be an airline pilot, which one do you wanna work for? You know, listen to me, you know that every Friday night to Saturday night, you're home with your family, you're out with your friends. Listen to me, all the airline pilots are off, all the stewardesses are off, all the ground control is off, all the people that do the luggage are off, they're all off, it's closed. They stopped, they stopped. That airline's never had a crash. No one's ever hijacked airplanes, everybody's rested. They're rested. It says, all of your male and female servants must rest as you do. Remember, you were once slaves in Egypt. This is so key, and many of us miss this. When Moses went to Pharaoh and demanded that the people of Israel be allowed to worship, do you know what he did? He increased their work. He said, you're gonna work larger, you're gonna work longer, and you're gonna work harder. You know what he did? He said, you don't get any straw for your bricks. And you have to meet the same quotas. He says, remember, you were once slaves in Egypt. You know why I want you to underline that? Because some of you are still slaves to Pharaoh. You don't work for God. You work for your career. You work for money. You're working a job you can't hate to buy things you don't need to impress people you don't even like. Do you know why? You're a slave to Pharaoh. You're a slave to Pharaoh. Your kids don't need more stuff, they need more of you. That's what they need. Your wife doesn't need more things, she needs more of you. That's the truth. 
You've bought into the American dream and it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. God says six days you'll work, one day you rest. He says the Lord God brought you out with his strong hand and his powerful arm. Jesus has saved you from being a slave to stuff and some of you make your slave, yourself a slave every day. This is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. Rest. But you know what the problem is? We don't know how to rest. We don't know how. Write this down. I must learn how to rest. Listen to me. If you want to be a parent someday or you're a parent of a young child, there's a reason your baby doesn't know how to rest. They don't know how to rest. You have to teach them. You have to teach them. It's time to rest. Whether the two-year-old feels like it or not. Right? Because a two-year-old without a nap is a terrorist. And they have demands. And they will kill us all. You got to learn how to rest. Man, our son. The sweetest, cutest little boy. But when it came time for naps, when it came time for sleep, he transformed into a beautiful little hobbit until a hellion. I kid you not. He was so bad. He was so rough. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bragging about this. We had to tie the door to his room closed. We would put him down to sleep on the other side of the door. Literally, my little sweet boy, you would hear this. And you're like, what is going on in there? And he would scream at us like he was being stabbed or eaten alive by animals. So we, took, we closed the door. We tied it shut. I put a chair in front of it. Some of you are like, that's not safe in case of a fire. We didn't leave. <laughs> I literally had to barricade the door so he would take a nap. Number one, so he needed to rest. Number two, so I didn't kill him. His mother would cry, oh, this is so cruel. I'm like, get behind me, Jezebel. I kid you not. Then all of a sudden, you know what happened? <laughs> you go open the door. You know where he is? He's asleep, stuck like right up against the door every time. <gasps> right? Because I'm not tired. I'm not tired. I must learn how to rest. Do you know why Americans can't sleep? Because we don't worship God. You know why you can't sleep at night? It's not because you're thinking about God. It's because you're thinking about work. And we'll get to that. Real rest is stopping. Stop it. Stop. Right? Just stop it. And here's the problem. You know, you, you know what you guys do? You keep adding. Oh, I'm single. I know what I'll do when I'll get married. I'll keep living like I'm single. Stop it. Oh, you get married, and then you have a kid. You know what we're going to do? We're going to pretend we didn't have a child, and we're going to keep doing everything that we're doing. Stop it. And then you have two kids and three kids, and you're insane. Four kids and five kids. Stop it. And you just keep adding. Oh, well, this kid plays the piano, and this kid plays basketball, and this kid plays soccer, and this kid. Stop it. Stop it. I told my wife, our kids will not be Olympic athletes. Stop it. They will not get a scholarship if we kill them. Stop it. We got to stop. We, gotta, we don't know how to stop. Listen to me. Here's why you can't start living for God, because you don't know how to stop. And here's the thing. You know what the first thing we cut out when we're tired is? God. It's a fr Oh, we're so busy. We haven't been at church lately. Stop it. What is wrong with you? Well, God understands no, he doesn't. It's written in stone. Well, we're under grace. Stop it! <laughs> Listen, it's not about the day, Paul says, but it is about stopping. Listen, I stop every day. Every day, I have a thing called a quiet time. Every single day. 
I read the Bible every day. I stop. Every day I pray. I stop. I stop. Every single week I gather together for community group. I stop. I stop. And every weekend, whether I'm at Sandals or somewhere else, we stop for worship, no matter where we are. Why? Because stopping for God is how you start living for God. That's how. You got to stop. Next, you got to make it regularly scheduled. Right? You want to tweak your kids, put them to bed at different times. You want to tweak your life, rest at different times. You've got to regularly schedule rest. And let me say this. Traveling is not resting. Some of you guys come back from vacation and you look worse when you get back. Oh my gosh, we just had a vacation. I'm dead. <laughs> you got to regularly schedule it. You got to stop. Next, you got to block out work. You got to block the work and the world out. You got to block it out. You guys, we're, we're terrible. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna go to bed, but I gotta win this watermelon on my phone. This is gonna, oh, I just want an imaginary watermelon. Stop it! What are you doing? Oh, you know what I'm gonna do before I go to bed? I'm gonna get on Instagram so I can be bitter. That'll help me sleep, okay? What's everybody doing tonight that I wasn't invited to? Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to follow people who have way more money than me and are prettier than I am, so I'm just, I hate God. Okay, that's going to help me sleep. What are you, stop it. Block work and the world out. Do, let, you, how many have ever done this? You've read a work email right before you go to bed. Uh! Pastor, I'm leaving the church because your humor is inappropriate. <laughs> Anybody ever done that? Read an email right before you go to bed and then you can't sleep? I know what I need to do since it's midnight. Respond. <laughs> right? Even if you love Trump, don't you wish he would tweet in the morning? Right? And, I mean, you love him. But those, the, the 3 a.m. tweets are not always worded maybe the way that you would like. Some of you are like Trump. You tweet at 3 a.m. I'm going to express my feelings. It's 2.30. Stop it. I'm going to send the pastor an email about his sermon. 3 a.m. Stop it. Block the work and the world out. I love this story. Mark 3, excuse me, Mark 4, 37 through 38, but a fierce storm came up. This is work for Jesus. Any teachers go back to work? You saw a kid came in? That's a fierce storm. That is a storm approaching. And then you saw the parents come in. That's a hurricane. That is a hurricane. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Let me translate this. The disciples are in a boat, and everybody thinks they're going to die. Look at Jesus. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a pillow. Why? Because he's God. He's smart. Pillows help you sleep better. Everybody thinks they're dying. Jesus is conked out. Pretty sure he didn't take his annex. Pretty sure it's not Tylenol PM. Pretty, pretty sure he hasn't done a sleep study. You know why he's sleeping? Because Jesus knows how to block out work and block out the world. Some of you don't know how to do that. The disciples woke him up, circled this word, shouting. You know what that means? Hey, Jesus. Hey. Hey, Jesus. Dad, Jesus! Jesus! We're dying! Wake up. Don't you care that we're going down? And you know what Jesus says? Oh, you of little faith. You really think you're going to die with God in the boat? And then you know what he says to the winds and the waves? Stop it! That's good. Okay. Real rest. Underline this is God focused. Or write it down. God focused focused this is why man you, you can go on your best vacation and become back more starving for rest than when you left because here's the thing here's what fills you here's what gives you rest the same person who gives you life God 
God. Psalms 4, 8, in peace I lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. Parents, pray with your kids when they go to bed. Think about the stupid things historically we say to children. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> if you should die before you wake, I pray the Lord your soul to take. <laughs> Johnny, don't look in the closet. Bye. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. In peace. Do you know why you should sleep well? Because God's in charge. He's got the world and he's got you. It's got to be God-focused. Six days you shall work. One day is dedicated to the Lord. There's only one thing you're allowed to work for on the Sabbath. God. 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 Next, real Sabbath should be relaxing and refreshing. Listen to me, young people. When you start off and you get married, you should be poor. It's the best thing for you, right? You know why poor marriages make it? Because where are you gonna go? <laughs> the rich people, I'm out of here. Poor people, are. I'm right here. Staying right here. But you know when you're poor, all you want is a day off. And you know what you do when you're poor on your day off? Nothing. When you get a little money, you start doing things. Then you get a little more money, you start going away for things. Then you get a little more money, you start traveling to places. Isn't it funny the more money you get, how far you have to go to rest? Stop it. Stop it. When you're poor, you're glad you have a tent. Then you need a camper. Then you need an RV. Then you need a condo. Then you need a house. Stop it! Stop it! Then you got a boat. Guess what you're doing on the Sabbath? Oh, oh. Listen to me. Those aren't hobbies. Those are part-time jobs, and you don't get paid. You don't get paid, and you wonder why you're so cranky. Shut up! I'm washing my boat. Stop it! It should be relaxing and refreshing. You know what I did? We went to Idaho for our vacation. People were, Idaho, why would you go to Idaho? That just does not sound refreshing. We went to Idaho and I floated on a lake. I literally, I had, a, I had a $10 floaty and I just floated on the lake. My wife says, you were out there a long time. I said, yes. She says, what were you doing? I said, floating away from you <laughs> and your sister <laughs> and our kids. No music, no iPhone, just me, a raft, and no one. My wife's watching me out in the lake. How's he doing that? You know, what's wrong? Come back. No. <laughs> no. When's the, when's the last time you just floated? You just floated. I didn't even care if I drowned, I was so relaxed. I just was like <sighs> People going by me on $200,000 boats, I'm on a $10 dinghy. I was like, you gotta wash that later, I'm throwing this away. <laughs> Who's the idiot now? Isn't that funny? People just watched me float. That guy's relaxed. Man, I don't know if you're on Instagram, but I saw something on Instagram about a month ago and I actually saved it. And I thought about reposting it, but I haven't because it's so controversial and it just grieves my soul. I know a lot of you have varying views on marijuana. I'm a big believer in not using it. That's who I am. Um, but here's what it said. It was a post of a mother holding an infant. And, and it, the caption read this. 
mommy needs a joint should be just as socially acceptable as mommy needs a glass of wine. Listen to me, moms. Here's what your kids don't need. You buzzed or stoned. Here's what your kids need. Kids need mommies who are well-rested and who have spent time with God, who are refreshed and have been relaxed and love their children the way God has commanded them. But listen to me, moms. If you can't obey the command to rest, you will not obey the command to love. That should break your hearts. Our culture, listen to me. You wanna know why there's such a big push for marijuana? Because we're all exhausted, and the only way we can stop is if we're stoned. And the reason, as a culture, we wanna be stoned is because we've forgotten what was written in stone. And we need to go back and we need to look at that. And we need to say, I need to rest. Like some of you, if you're married, here's how you stop the fight. I'm really cranky. I need a nap. Stop it. Listen to me. You know how you know God loves you? Here's what Jews and all Christians have affirmed. You know what you can do on the Lord's Day? It's been affirmed by every Christian council, by every Jewish Orthodox group. Here are the things you are allowed to do on the Sabbath. A, nothing. B, work for the Lord. C, make love to your spouse. Why? Because God is good. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, my parents always took a nap after church. And my mom would say, we're all going to rest. And I didn't understand why everyone was so excited about nap time. <laughs> and my dad would say, your mother and I are going into the room. And you're going into your room. And if you come out of your room for any reason, and you should knock on my door, I will kill you. <laughs> are we clear? I'm on a Sabbath, Dad. Okay. I'm going to go in here. You know, I was playing with my Legos. They were doing other things. Because God is good. God is good. And you need to understand, isn't that amazing? Jews and Christians alike, throughout the centuries, what can we do on the Sabbath? When you're married, we can't do anything. Hmm. All right. Single people, get married. It's good. All right. Next. Last point. Oh, wow, I'm going late. You guys are listening slow. Okay. <laughs> only, only Jesus can provide real rest. Amen? We live in a culture that's turning to more stuff, more things, more hobbies, more sports. Man, you're putting your kids in everything. You're trying to do everything. You're trying to be a part of everything. Jesus says, stop it. Stop it. Listen to the words of Jesus. Then Jesus said, come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens... Doesn't our society need Jesus? All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and G this is what God says, and I will give you rest. I will. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You know what? Let me write this in there. This is what Jesus says. Come to work for me. That's what he's saying. You don't have to work for Pharaoh anymore. He says, come to work for me because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your what? Your soul, your soul. Let's just bow our heads, let's close our eyes. And let's cry out to the God who not only loves our bodies, but loves our souls. To the God who sent his son to die for us on the cross so that we could rest. Do you need to repent right now? Do you need to get your life right now? Some of you are working. Some of you have a whole list of things to do today that you need to stop. You need to stop. And you need to take the day and rest. And say, God, fill me. God, bless me. God, inspire me. Jesus has come to me. Come to me. Don't run to other things. Run to me. And I, Jesus says, will give rest for your souls. Heavenly Father, we pray to you. You are the good Father. You love us. You care for us. 
and you've commanded us to rest because you are so good, you are so great. God, help us to repent right now of our busyness. Help us to stop. It's not about getting more religious. It's about resting. Help us to rest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. I hope you rest today. We have a chance to start something new. You know, every day that the sun comes up, it is a physical living testimony to us that God is giving us more grace, more time, more opportunity to chase after things that he desires for our lives. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna sing another song that hopefully is an encouragement to us to decide and to declare even that we want to put more and more things that God is desiring in our lives uh, in place. And as we do that, we're gonna give together. So I'm gonna ask that you guys would stand to your feet as we sing a new song. The song is called, Yes I Will.
So glad you joined us today. Listen, if, if it's not obvious by now, Sandals Church, we deeply, deeply care about you. Man, we know that some of you have challenges that you're facing in your relationships, maybe in your marriage, maybe at work, man, maybe because of the fires, uh, maybe with your finances, maybe with health or pregnancy, or all kinds of issues that you're carrying. And every single weekend, we close our service with a time of prayer. We've got ministers, leaders here at our church who would love to pray with you. Man, why not take advantage of a church who wants to come alongside you and support you, help you take off some of your baggage, let us pick it up and carry that load with you. If you got something going on that's stressing you out about the rest of this week, that's, that's leading toward the life of unrest, man, don't just walk out of here carrying those things. Come on down, let's pray about those things together. And if you're curious at all about what it looks like to step into a relationship with Jesus, we'd love to talk to you and pray with you about that down here at the front of the room. In the meantime, we hope you guys have a great, great week, and we'll see you back here next weekend with Pastor Matt. Peace.